Man, this camera is such a piece of shit. It's good that it came free with the lens at least. Oh, hey. Hey, guys. Johnny, how was your summer? Oh, hey. What's up, Perry? How you doing? Ah, I'm, I'm good. I have a uh, really shitty camera in front of me. But uh, enjoying the last remnants of the summer holiday. How you been? It, um, it's all been a blur, dude. I've been moving, so it's just all been a big blur. All settled in? No, I'm kind of getting there. Sort of. Did you um? Did you have to do anything to check your uh, your new house for like ghost hauntings? Um, it was only ha- haunted by the former owner, who was a f-ing moron, and <laughs> fixed everything like half-assed and hit a bunch of stuff that we found after we moved in that was f-ed up. So, uh, um, other than that ghost, the ghost of homeowner past, uh, there have been no ghosts here. <laughs> Which is pretty you know, awesome. I, I, I'm gonna be you I, in a couple of months. I'm gonna be you. Yeah, and not not literally. That would that would suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, before um, we're, we're moving to a new place, and before we we did that, my partner she said to me that she was gonna go into the house and do this like some kind of traditional Chinese ritual where they they burn shit and then. Oh, wow like sign a contract with any spirits in the house to tell them like please go away um and she specifically asked me not to go with her because she was like you are going to offend any and all spirits who may or may not be in there so why because you're because you're canadian no because i think she was afraid that i would make sarcastic comments (laughs) um she's right she's right (laughs) So, so yeah yeah. Yes, Simon. Yes, yes, right. yes. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing, but apparently everyone does it here. They like literally wow. sign a contract with any ghost in the house, tell them to go away, uh, burn some pork so they can eat that up in hell. And uh, you know, while the ghosts are enjoying their barbecued pork, we just uh slide into their, their DMs. Well slide into their old house. And they just pay them off in Chinese crypto. That's that's not legal anymore. Oh, it's like not legal anymore. I thought they had their own crypto, not not the freaking Bitcoin. I mean, like their own the you know the state crypto. I, I don't know. I do not know if that has been launched or if it's just vaporware. Okay, Simon, you're chilling here in Stoke. How was your summer, man? Yeah, you know, from Hong Kong, Chicago, and the city of Stoke on Trent. This is the Classic Lenses Podcast. You thought we were dead, bitches! Yes. Hello and welcome. We're back. It's episode 145. My name is Simon Forster and I'm joined by Johnny Sisson and Perry G. Hello, Johnny. Hello. Hello, Perry. Hello. I feel we should do something we haven't done for ages. What's the weather like, Johnny? Um, it is hot and humid here, but you know what? I don't give a f- because I have air conditioning now and it's working as opposed to when I moved in and it wasn't working. So it is uh, about 70 degrees in here because us Americans like it cold in the summer. And now you're, you're actually officially a proper homeowner now, aren't you? So you can really. Well, I people. am a proper mortgage owner. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I'm a heavily indebted mortgagee. That's kind of like being a homeowner. Yeah. I mean, the air conditioning is key, right? It, it's, it's the ultimate, like, um, what is it? A tragedy of the commons um, yeah. type thing or, or, or almost like a prisoner's dilemma because, with, with you know, we're all going to die of climate change. But Right, right, right. I don't care but, as long as we die comfortably. That's fine. Yeah, Got gotta to have my air conditioning. Yeah. I remember when I was, when I was in Canada um, – and I got a place, I, I would not look at anywhere that didn't have air conditioning because I'd come yeah. from Hong Kong. And it's like, no, I can't live without air con in the summer. I'm going to die. Right. And uh, that year, I think it was the 2014 World Cup. It was hot as balls in Toronto. Yeah. And everyone just came to my house every day to watch the football. And just, <laughs> so I knew that really the motivation for coming to my place was I was the only one with air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially the with if we're going to live here for like 20 years while the world is burning – um, I got really good, super efficient air conditioning, and the next thing will be a solar backup array 
Oh yeah, so nice. When the, when the grid melts down, we'll at least be able to run the air conditioner. I don't care about anything else. Mm-hmm. That's sweet. Yeah. I was going to say, from a long-term perspective, that might not be so good, because if things go as they might do, and the and the planet keeps on heating up, then it might affect the uh, the Gulf Stream uh, more. Oh, it's higher. already screwed. It's that's already dead. That's already there and killed it. Yeah. It's that already means, dead. That means we're going to get an ice age, though. Or you will, anyway. Actually, we. Will. That's fine. I got a new furnace too. Ah, oh, that's okay. So you 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 could. <laughs> I'm covered. Yeah. So Wait, what the hell are you talking about, Simon? Have you not heard of the Atlantic Conveyor? And that's not a boat, although there is a boat called the Atlantic Conveyor. It's what, do, what does it, that have? Yeah. It's to do with the, the Gulf Stream, which brings up warm water from the southern oceans, uh, up, well, the southern, South Atlantic, and takes it up north and goes past uh, the UK, which is one of the reasons why the UK doesn't freeze in, as much as it should do with the latitude that it's on. Um, and then it goes up to the up to the polar area. It then cools down. And it brings back some colder, I think, salt. It should bring back some salty water and send the salty water down south. And the whole thing goes round in a bit of a loop. But if the polar ice caps, well, not, not actually, no, polar ice caps don't really matter because they, they can melt and they, things won't rise. Although it would actually increase the amount, it, it reduce the salinity of the water, that, that, which would be a problem. But that's not really the issue. It's more about the on land ice melting you know in the fjords and places like that that's that's the stuff that raises the uh the the water um the 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 uh what what, what, what is it the height of the water it's not the tide is it but it's, um the water level that's it um so uh, the the point being is if this salt this if the water is fresher and heads south then that has something to do with stopping this thing going around in its cycle and then that would mean that the warm air, the warm water would stop coming up to the north. And then that would then trigger the north getting colder. And then you have an ice age. So that answers the question about what you've been doing this summer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Did you, uh, did you, yeah. did you graduate with a two one in your, uh, meteorology degree? Not, not quite with that explanation. That's, that's, that's for sure. Um, but um, but yeah, so there, there's a, there's a happy start, and um, I would I would actually say you know how how's how's life in Hong Kong at the moment? But I already know uh, because it's perfect and everything is great in Hong Kong, and 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 that that's it because that's that's what you've been telling us for 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 months now. So it's it's all very dull now because everything's just normal and everyone's happy. That that's correct, isn't it, Perry? Sure. Yes. yes. That's it. That's good. That's good. I'm glad. I'm glad we've we've got that one covered. It, it, it is. Uh, can I? Can I just say? I mean, I, I don't think I'll go to jail for this. It is very weird living in a totalitarian regime. It is really weird. Like you know, when I think about Russia, right? I always get this image of people where everyone knows what's up, but then nobody says what's up because if you say what's up, you're gonna die, <laughs> right? Right. And I was like, that. I always thought that must be so weird to live under. And now we're living under that. And it's really weird. It's really weird. Yeah. Otherwise, everything is fine. Yeah. yeah. It's been <laughs> raining nonstop. But otherwise. <clears throat> oh, that's good. And uh, we were chatting earlier. And you've, you've bought yourself a new lens and a new camera. And it's not expensive. I have, I have, I, I have a, a couple actually, but but only one in the last couple of months because I've been busy with other stuff. Um, so I have in front of me uh, this. I don't even know what this camera is. Um, the lens on it is an M42 lens, uh, one that is renowned for being both terrible in its build quality and crazy in its rendering. I think both of you have this lens, right? It is a Fujinon. Yeah. Uh, it says Lens Japan Fujinon 55mm f2.2 uh, M42 lens, which I think was like a kit lens on a lot of their Fujika cameras. Uh, and is a, it is attached to a Fujika ST605, um, which is in very good condition, but I have no intention of using it. Uh, it's very small, it's compact. The tripod socket is in a very stupid place. Um, yeah, but so let's talk about this lens. Yeah. Well, no, no, let's just talk about that tripod socket for a moment. 
because uh -huh. it's, it's utterly bizarre because normally it's it would be lined up with the uh say central axis of the of the lens that's that, yes. that's like a normal place to put it but in your case it's it's offside uh on, on to one side yeah not only is it offside but um and therefore no goal but uh, oh by the way um i hope you've recovered from england uh you know not yeah. bringing it home yeah we'll, we shall move on now all right <laughs> Uh, so normally, right, when you have, like, the tripod socket off-center, um, it's sort of centered along the edge. Uh, our listeners can't hear this, uh, can't see this, but I'm pointing to where it normally is, right? It's, like, kind of in the middle, equidistant from everything on the edge. But this is just, like, it's underneath the, the I guess, the sink port. Um, so it's a, in a totally nonsensical location, I, and... and yeah. Why they put it here? Uh, I mean, but to be fair, lots of cameras have them offset. I mean, the, the, yeah. the Leicas do, so I don't know. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, on a Leica, it's offset, but it's equidistant from yeah. the edge, right? So at least it's offset in a kind of central way. Whereas here, it just looked like they picked a random spot on the bottom and drilled a hole. <laughs> you know? At least it's in line with the, um, the, the film rewind release button. But other than that, it's totally nonsense. I suppose if you if you when you if your tripod isn't quite level, then with it being off center, it would it'll be it'll be able to apply more weight to it to one side and therefore level it up. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. It's like a gun sight with a built-in co wind compensation. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I haven't used the camera. I, I don't know if I ever will. Um, this one's in very good condition, uh, but it was free. The maximum shutter speed is 700, by the way. So it goes, um, it goes from 250 to 500 to 700, uh, which I take to mean they just tried to make a shutter speed faster than 500, couldn't quite get it to 1,000, and were like, eh, screw it. <laughs> no, I think, I, I think it's truth in advertising, because most, most, shutter speed, most cameras with a top shutter speed of 1,000 don't hit 1,000 anyway. So I think they were just being, you know, showing their precision and honesty that makes sense i mean the lens is labeled f2.2 as well so um i mean they could have called that f2 and no one would have noticed that's true yeah or maybe it's a thousand and f2 and they just made it different to look cool that could be that's also possible it, it could be it, it could be just understated mm -hmm. yeah you know, you know, there are plenty of cars out there that have got more power than they actually say that they have and they just don't want to show off. Yeah, they think like thousands of show off sort of speed. We'll say well, ours won't go that fast, but yet, yeah, well, it will really. I should build an Arduino to test this camera. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't have anything to say about this camera unless either of you wants to talk about the Fujika ST six hundred five. Well, doesn't it weirdo from that? Sunny sixteen podcast like those things. <laughs> he does, yeah. That'd be, yeah. That'd, be, that'd be Graham, yeah. Oh right, there we go, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah he's a fan, and uh, there's nothing wrong with them. I mean, other than they're why? Oh, oh, there's one really cool thing with this lens. With this lens, it's one to one. It is, yeah. That's true. Oh, I just I just discovered that. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I actually I'm 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 quite a fan of that lens. I mean, for what it is, I think it's more interesting than lots yeah. of other lenses. I'd oh, certainly the, rather I'd rather certainly rather own that than uh, Helios forty four. Well, let, well, let's talk about the lens in a moment. But this is actually really neat that this lens fifty five millimeter with the magnification on this finder. Yeah, it's just like straight up pure one to one. That's very cool. Um, just, just, really just for the sake of um, some people who don't quite understand what it is you're saying there with being one to one, do you, do you want to just explain that? Yeah, it's just, it's just when you um, look through the viewfinder, uh, it's the same magnification as if you didn't have a camera there. So you can look through the viewfinder with both eyes open. It's kind of stupid on SLR. It's much better on a rangefinder. Um, but basically, you can look with both eyes open, and uh, yeah. you don't have one that's like magnified or shrunken. So, no, of course it depends on the lens, but this, this uh, yeah, lens that, gives was, you one. Yeah, exactly. Because I've, I've always thought that was more lens dependent, uh, and fifty-five seems a bit long. 
really to well, uh, but that. but but the the viewfinder has its own native magnification, right? Right. So yeah. to get one to one with any specific pairing, you need a specific lens with a specific camera. Yeah. So this but lens on this camera gives you one to one, which is the cool. Minolta X seven hundred with a fifty one point seven is the same way, so you can shoot it both eyes open. Right. Right. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. That's 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 a plus. Hmm. Yeah. So the lens. Um, I, I bought this for the lens. The camera came free. Um, I think this lens is quite notorious, right? Uh, it's it's dirt cheap. Um, it's made of plastic, and it is known for having cracks in both the aperture ring and the, the focus ring. Um, and the rendering is kind of insane. It, I, I don't... Re- I mean, there's this entire line of, like, Fujika M42 lenses with with kind of insane rendering, but this one, it's, um, I only use it on digital. I don't really know how to describe it, but like the edges are terrible and it does crazy bokeh things. But when it is in its sweet spot, which I've not discovered yet, uh, it really does have a great kind of 3d pop with, um, with, uh, backgrounds that are very characteristic of this lens and not many others. They, they, they really didn't put a lot of effort in correcting this very much. A lot of people use it for macro. Uh, a lot of people stick it on like a helicoid, and then they just get like crazy bokeh. It it, it gives um amazing uh, halo circles and stuff. It's really mm-hmm. good for Christmas lights. Ah, okay, yeah. I'll bear that in mind for Christmas. Yeah, that's that's why I got mine. Just to, I think I bought it actually on like Christmas Eve at Central Camera, and I was like, hey, can I can I get this lens? And I you know. I, Paid like twenty five dollars for it, and bought it specifically just to shoot Christmas lights. Total you, your pony. You bought a lens specifically for bokeh. I was thinking exactly well, the same no, thing. Well, no, for though. Chris for Christmas lights, it's different. No, were the Christmas lights in focus? Of course not. <laughs> but it was wasn't so much for. It was so that it, when they happened to be in the frame, they would look interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as bokeh. I, I guess you could say that, but yeah, I wasn't meaning to shoot. It wasn't bokake because I wasn't meaning to shoot just the bokeh. So right, yeah. But I mean, so that's it's accidental. It's incidental bokeh. Bokeh. That, that sounds pretty deliberate. You, yeah. You're buying it at at Christmas on Christmas Eve for the Christmas light bokeh. Yeah. Well, no, because this stuff's going to be in the background, so you might as well make it look interesting. That's all. <laughs> bokeh is often yeah. in the background. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's often in the foreground. That's the problem. <laughs> I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. But I, I still think that's that that counts as buying a lens for bokeh. Uh, yes, it, technically, I think you're right. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was, was going to say uh, when you when you mentioned that you're going to be talking about that lens, I, I got all excited uh, because I've got. I picked up a, um, I bought a few things over over the summer, but one of the things that I picked up, and not deliberately, it was part of a job lot, uh, and it was a a um, a Rico KR. I think it was probably a KR10. I'm not sure if it was a Super or something like that, um, which is even less exciting than that Fujika. Um, but on it. It had a lens that I was not expecting to see when I took the lens cap off because I was expecting to see uh, um, the good old fashioned uh, Japanese cheap Sumicron 50mm f2 uh, Rikanon, um, which I'm actually pretty convinced is actually a, the uh, ubiquitous um, uh, Tomioka 50mm uh, f2. Um, but this one actually had a Rikanon 55mm f2.2. Yeah. And I'm thinking, how many 55 millimeter 2.2s are there out there? And I could only think of one. And it feels really cheap. Plastic. Yeah. And it feels. I think this one is pre-cracked. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's uh, it's definitely got some uh, some scope to actually go there. What I haven't had a chance to do is actually try it. Um, but it's uh, it's on Pentax K mount, uh, which makes it. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, but some of those um, Fujikas have, have got the old uh, AX mount or whatever they, whatever they called it, so that can make mm. it a little bit awkward to uh, to get unless you've got the adapter. And not many people have got those adapters. So, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to giving this a try because I, I do have that Fujin on somewhere. Although, again, I 
I'm pretty sure I may have it on the on the Fuji mount rather than M42. Um, but I'll I'll put the two things together because yeah, it feels similarly crap. Um, so um, it may well give similar effects. And if that's the case, then it will then sort of make me wonder about who actually made that lens in the first place. Um, mm. Because would Ricoh buy lenses off Fuji? Or vice versa, when Rico were almost certainly buying lenses off other makers, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Tommy Oka was was one of them. And then that, by extension, if this lens is a third party lens, then are there other versions out there that we've just not come across? So, be curious to know if anybody listening has come across any other uh, cheap feeling 55 millimeter f 2.2 uh, lenses. So, uh, see if there are any others out there. I like uh, I like the idea of a pre-cracked lens, yeah. it's like a uh, pre pre-torn jeans, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, speaking of adapters, um, this is my first M42 lens that doesn't have like a clear manual auto mode. Oh yeah. Uh, and 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 I as as a noob to this kind of lens, um, I would like to ask about this little tab at the back that prevents me from using it properly on my M42 to Sony adapters. Um, Johnny, Johnny, you told me uh, that if I if I were to file it down, no, uh, I would never have said that. You know, no, no, no. You you called me some kind of. Uh, oh, I'll uh, see where you're of, going with it. Yeah. yeah, you called me some kind of expletive for suggesting that. Right. I don't. I don't remember what your word of choice was. It was a while ago, but it's um, probably like heathen, just heathen or something. Something like that. Yes. Yeah. Um. So so so, can you guys explain? what the hell this tab is, why it is there, and what one needs to do in order to use these lenses uh, I, on. I think this is one of those cases where you need one of those stupid M42 adapters that presses the thingy down. Yeah, presses yeah. the little tab at the back. But, right. I mean, the problem is, like, with, with my current adapters, basically if I screw it all the way in, yeah. it only screws as far as the, the, the little tab. Right. But then that prevents the aperture ring from moving, and it's not at infinity. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's like yeah, you that's 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 down to the adapters that you've got and uh, you need to get yourself a different adapter. Um, yeah. and uh, I would suggest you get one from somebody like K&F. Um, and they I mean when I, I mean I don't sell K&F adapters anymore. Uh, but when when I was um, when I first started selling them, um, that was a problem that I was getting with uh, well with with Fuji lenses and also some Takamas, and I think there was a, another one out there that was um, that was a bit of a problem. And how KNF got over that? They they fitted a um, oh what's the opposite of a rebate where it comes out? It's almost like it's embossed, but that's not the, quite the right word, is it? Um, Unbait. An unbait, yeah. Let's call it an unbait. Um, so there was an opposite of a rebate. Um, so. I heard you're. A, I heard you're an expert in unbaiting. <laughs> so, so the um, they they added an unbait uh, to the um, to where the thread is. So the thread you got, you got to keep things out. clean. Yeah. So the thread actually um, protrudes uh, out from the uh, the main part of the the flange of the of the adapter, and then that in itself then gave a little bit more room on the on the outside of it or on the inside. I can't quite remember, but ultimately it worked. Um, so uh, so so it sticks out from uh, the adapter yeah, like some yeah only by, by, by only by about a millimeter. I mean it's a tiny amount. Oh, so, so it's not like it's not like a, it doesn't look like some kind. I don't know some kind of prolapse adapter or something. Like that. <laughs> no, okay, no, not, not not at all. No, um, a minor one, a very very minor one. Um, but that uh, that extra space um, resolved those problems, and I'm pretty sure that will that would work with um, with with that particular lens. And it also presses the pin down. Yes, because in inside it there's a, a circle, a circular ledge. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, and it would um, attach to the ledge. I mean, a lot of those um, adapters you can actually remove the ledge, uh, unscrew the thing, and, and it pops out if you if you if you so wished. Um, Johnny's always had a problem with that ledge. I've never had a problem with the ledge. I've never, I've, even though Johnny's like moaned about it loads and loads of times, like saying it, it's messed up and whatever. I've I've just never had a problem with with them with with ledges. So I, I just don't never quite got the animosity towards them. See, so they just work for me. Mm, yeah, if you don't, if you don't like, if you don't have preset lenses, they do maybe. But preset lenses just bang right into them and don't hit it. I've not, I've not, I've well, 
I've used plenty of preset lenses with those adapters and never had a problem. But I, I, I can see how some might, you know, if, yeah. they, if they're a little bit uh, broader in the diameter, then uh, then they could catch it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, a lot of them do. Mm. So, okay, so if I if I do get a proper adapter for this lens, which which I probably will need to do. Um, that adapter is going to probably cost more than the lens. So, are there any other lenses that require uh, this that have this stupid tab that are are worth looking at, um, so that my adapter can not just be a Fujinon uh, fifty five two point two have, have you got a holder? Have you got a Takamo fifty two uh, fifty one point four? Uh, no, I have a fifty five one point eight. Yeah, so I'm my super multi coated. Um, had a problem with the older older style adapter um and the i mean the, the knf have actually got a new new kind now they're like on a generation three now which i've not tried uh, which but i assume that they've uh, carried the design over from generation two um, but that that used to give me problems on on my original knf adapters um possibly this might resolve the problem with the uh, Mamiya SX lenses as well. I'm not, I, I don't know for certain because I've not, not had an SX lens for absolutely ages, but the SX lenses had a metering pin, an extra pin, not, not one for mm. doing the aperture. And, uh, and that would just grind itself right into the mount of your adapter or your M42 camera. And um, it's possible if that, uh, if that bit that protrudes is also relatively narrow in its diameter, it might miss that pin so um which which be a good thing um so uh so there you go get yourself a mamiya sx lens as well just just to see if that works okay yeah because i would i mean I, i'm actually thinking like do i do i actually need a dedicated adapter or should i just stick this thing on a helicoid and then have macro well you spent if you I'm... want to control the aperture or not but see if you, if you have a helicoid a helicoid uh... it, won't, it won't touch the pin Oh crap! You're right. Can I can I tape the pin down? You can do that. Yeah, that's acceptable. You're fine. It's it's, it's probably harder than you think. Yeah, the pin the pin has quite <laughs> a lot <not>. of uh, <laughs> uh, the pin. No, the pin the pin has quite a lot of uh, upward thrust. <laughs> you push it down, you can feel the resistance. Yeah. <laughs> so just, just wait till you up. get old, Perry. <laughs> When you push it down, it won't even spring back up. <laughs> okay, mm, that might be. That I might, mean, well, it's still here. That's you know. That uh, maybe there's some kind of pill I can give it. Maybe. Um, no, but I mean, yeah, it's too close to the edge, right? Tape would probably get in the way of the threads. Ugh. Yeah. Because I mean, this lens, you know. Why, wait a second. Can we go back? Why would you not just ever? Why would you ever shoot this lens not wide open? It's Good a point. piece of junk. Why are you worried? Why? Yeah, you're not supposed to be worried about the adapter or the aperture. Just but, shoot, shoot it wide open. But you know, the reason I got this lens wasn't strictly for the like crazy bokeh on its own. That I have seen some shots that I I, I would guess are something around 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 f four or something, where it had a really nice kind of rendering of the center subject. You know, it it had a very crisp sort of. Well, the, that, that, that pop. But can, then a lot of lenses do that. You can have any number of choices of lenses with proper pins that'll do that, though. That's true. This, that's this, lens, this lens is a one-trick pony. It's a wide-open bokake lens. That's all it is. That makes onion rings. Right, so all the more reason to put it on a helicoid. Yes, and shoot it wide open. <laughs> uh, why yeah. are we talking about lenses, anyway? <laughs> Okay, so I, I like I like I like that advice. Um, I may I may go shopping. We'll see. Yeah, just try it that way first. All right. Um, that that that's all I got on this lens. I mean, I don't know, unless you guys want to wax lyrical about your own bokeh experiences with it. I think I, I think I've, I'm interested in trying the the thing that I've got here. But assuming it is the same lens, I want to see mm-hmm. how it compares with my. Uh, Exactar 55 1.8 uh, the, the yeah. worst stroke best 55mm uh, lens ever made uh, yeah I mean ultimately right like I've got so many goddamn 50mm lenses that it, it really only makes sense to buy these really crazy you know bad ones now yeah um, 
be, because there's just you know like no, nothing is going to be better than like a 50 sumo lexus spherical um so go in the other direction although having said that um i lie because the other lenses i picked up are 50 millimeters that are better mm. um I, I did this like weird thing on eBay where I a couple a couple of months ago, like shortly after our last show, um, I bought three lenses that were converted to M mount, uh, and w- with rangefinder coupling. Uh, it's not super accurate, but it's adjustable. But basically, like some Italian kind of smashed together their own sort of adaptations, um, and. I, I won all three auctions because I think nobody else was like, everyone else was like, what is this? <laughs> um, but the newest trend seems to be, uh, I, I don't know what Hamish, Hamish has a specific term for like, what was this? Johnny, I saw you commenting about this a couple days ago about doing something to your your lenses to make them like a M mount rangefinder coupled. I said this? Yeah, someone, someone uh, was it Lucas Frazee or someone like that posted something about it was like verbing your Leica. Oh. I can't remember what the word was, but it sounded kind of like, it sounded kind of dirty. Um, <laughs> and you said we needed to make a shirt out of it. That's what oh, I Oh, 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 right. Oh, no, it was some dude who, it was like, yeah, it was like some uh, lens service place. Yes, he, he wanted to do a Contorex, right? Yeah. What? Yeah, and it was like verbing your Leica. Right. Right, but I can't remember what the verb was. <laughs> I don't was like it was like verb camera or something like or verb. I can't. That was yeah. What the hell? That was weird. Um, I was like two. Hey, we'll, we'll try to find it because it was funny. But that was like two days ago. Um, but but this seems like the the thing that people are doing. You know, converting stuff to like M mount with rangefinder coupling. So I got uh, a couple of lenses um, and had this done for a few lenses that I have already. So I won't talk about the lenses that I already have. But one of them that I picked up uh, was a Voigtlander Septon 50 millimeter f2. Oh yeah, where did you where did you find that? On eBay. Oh, sweet. Uh, DKL mount, yeah, of course. But it comes with a uh, DKL to Leica M mount adapter rangefinder cup. Oh shit! So this is I've never seen anything like this before, and it looks like the guy made it himself. Wow. Um, but. Essentially, it's an adapter. You can take the lens off. Like I could take the lens off and put it on, on a retina if, if I were high, right? Um, but you you put you put it on this adapter and it's, it's rangefinder coupled. Um, I mean, I've been using it on my Sony because whatever. But this lens is really good, and I've never seen a coupled DKL to Leica adapter before. So I would I would be highly suspicious of the actual. Well, I mean, if you've tested it, I would just be highly suspicious of. The, so the actual coupling accuracy. It works. The way that it works is you, you kind of have to adjust it, but it works. Uh-huh. Um, is the adapter pretty much looks like a DKL adapter. And then at the back, um, you know how on lenses like the uh, like the, the, the telephoto, like the long Leica lenses, the coupling mechanism instead of a ring is like this, just like this stick that moves back and forth. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like the, the Nikkor, the Nikkor LTM 85 and 105 have that. So the mechanism on this is like that, where it's just like a stick that moves back and forth. And then you can use a screw to kind of adjust it back and forth if it's off. Oh, all right. Um, and, and, and I can't quite figure out how it works, but I know like the DKL lenses, they can couple on the uh, Retina 3 whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there is that little like groove in the back, which mm-hmm. engages a pin. Um, right. But it, this doesn't look like it's using that mechanism. It's, it looks like it's just registering how far back and forward the lens is and then transferring yeah. that to a coupling mechanism. Okay. Um, I agree. I, I don't really trust the coupling mechanism. It's just cool to have. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've just been using it on a Sony with my um, Eon adapter. That's but cool. uh, I, I've never seen that before, so that's cool. But the lens itself, I know Anthony Vru is a huge fan of this lens. Yeah, that's a, it's a nice lens. It's I've, really good. That's been on my my wants list for ages and ages, but they they never show up. They always show up really expensive, and I yeah, just uh, either really know. expensive or yeah. uh, with separation. That's the yeah. biggest. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
so it, it's I just just, yeah. to, just to jump in there the, the post you're talking about it was by philip len and this is in our our facebook group the classic lenses podcast facebook group and uh, the phrase uh, that you were searching for um uh, it came uh, via anul jindal um who uh, mentioned somebody called Lang- uh, like a spanker a spanker yeah, like a spanker like a- yeah. Spank your Leica. Spank your right? Leica. Yeah. 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 Like so so that's that's what this guy did. He, he spanked a couple of like lenses onto Leica. Um nice. so, so yeah, the Septon has has uh no it's notorious for separation, so keep an eye out for that. But um the it's huge as well. It's like absurdly large for what it is. But the thing about this lens is optically it seems to have the same optical design as the Hasselblad 80 millimeter planar. Mm. I think, which I think makes it like, I think it's a five element um, with a huge front element, a smaller rear element, and it just does this like, wait, wait, yeah. Wait, so wait. It, are, are we saying that a septon is not yes. seven elements? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, it might be seven elements. I'm, I'm looking it up now, but I think it has the same lens design uh, as the as the Hasselblad lens. I'm, I'm hold on. Uh, you have me doubting. Mm. Septon lens diagram. There we go. One, two, three, four. Okay, yeah, it has seven elements. You're you're, you're right. Who, who that guess? makes sense. <laughs> yep, yeah, that makes sense. That makes well. I mean, you know, do 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 all do all hexanon lenses have uh, six oh, elements? Oh, that's a brand, though, isn't it? So uh, no, I, I, I don't believe that at all. Yeah. Um, what would? No, they, obviously they don't do that for for all lens designs. Yeah, but so anyway, yes, you're right. It's seven elements. Uh, that makes sense because it has sept. Um, wait, September is not the seventh month. It used to be. What? Yeah, months. It, the, it, yeah, they, we didn't start off with twelve months. Wait, what are you talking about? I thought the months were named after like Roman gods. Yeah, they were, and and, but they they kept adding them in. Like somebody was like, fa- uh, you know, particularly famous Roman in vain, and uh, decided, well, I-, I want my own month. Said uh, Janus for January and stuff like that. And 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 so, and where, so where does this? Well, that but that would have meant that it may well have been the uh, the seventh. It would might have been the seven months before, and then they just jigged jigged it around a bit, and it got stuck out of place. Are you yeah. sure? I'm pretty sure of that, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think I was about seven when I learned it. So, and I've not needed that information ever, ever again until now. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, my, my memory might be a little bit vague, um, but, um, but yeah, if you uh, stick, a, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, there were a couple of months added, and they it just jinked them down because probably through vanity they wanted to put the their their month at the start of the calendar. Okay, See, that makes this sense. is what we're supposed to be talking about, guys. <laughs> this is better. I'm I'm gonna fact check you. <laughs> <laughs> what right now? <laughs> yeah. Ah, you're right. September comes from the Latin root septum, meaning seven, because in the original Roman Republican calendar, September was the seventh month of the year rather than the ninth. All right. Hmm. I learned something. That's cool. Well, I'm done talking about the lens. This is more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, is this a natural segue to other Voigtlander lenses, or do we want to hold that? Oh, yes. I well, I think that's probably is a, is a good po- a good time to talk about because we actually could be topical on this one. But there's something I want to talk about later, which isn't that topical anymore. Um, but I feel I need to get it off my chest. Um, yeah. But on a topical point of view a um, couple of days ago um, Voigtlander or Casino Voigtlander um, launched or at least put some publicity out for a new lens uh, which is a, their VM so it's um, like M mount 50 millimeter f 1.5 helio and it's a six element lens mm-hmm. um, and it's a 1.5 and if we cast our minds back to, uh, to uh, Jason Lane um, talking about lens designs and this is where things are going to start getting complicated um, but I'm pretty damn certain he was saying you can't make a fast Helio with the with the 
configuration of the lenses that are actually in the Helio, which is a five, it's a modified Tessar um, five element lens. But so having the, said that. So is the Fujinon 55 2.2. So, you know, go figure. But, but having said that, right, one of the things we also learned from uh, Jason is that the the name describes like the family of lenses and how it goes about correcting yes. uh, aberrations. And so a Heliar, like it really, when you look at the lens design, it does look like a Heliar and therefore a Tessar-esque design where they've added another element. So, you know, in terms of their, their, their marketing, so to speak, the means with which this lens does its thing could be Heliar like. I looked at some of the sample photos and they do have some of that characteristic like slight swirl on the edges for the Heliar. Mm. Maybe that extra element is what it took to make it fast. I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. And, and, and I've got to say, as much as I've, I've got a little bit of a problem calling it a Heliar, um, which I could be completely wrong on that because of the, the point that you made there. Because I mean, going back to that podcast in particular, we were talking about uh, sonar lenses having about 12 elements in them and stuff like that and uh, mm-hmm. and we were saying this can't be right and then we were just like slapped down uh, by Jason who knows what he's talking about um, so but I, I've just got what well, again going back to Jason Lane you it you know a certainly a Heliar in its purest form cannot go that fast um, and uh, so it's Heliar issue. I mean, you'll, you certainly look at the photographs, though, and to me, they look like they were from a Heliar. I mean, they look pretty mm-hmm. pretty much as bad as they do out of my uh, Pentax um, 58 2.4, um, mm-hmm. which is obviously a good thing, uh, but it's also a bad thing. I mean, they're, 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 they're soft, they're creamy. Um, yes, they've got that sort of a, a sort of swirl. There's coma going on there. There's 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 all sorts of things. I think it's it's a beautiful. I think the effect is lovely. Um, I think the um, the look of the lens itself, just actually as a physical object, I think they've done really well with it. I think it, look, it they've done something to make it look different from from other lenses. It looks like it's a really old design, but it's new. It looks a lot like the Nocton, doesn't it? I mean, it, the old, it looks a lot like the old Nocton, like the, like, like the original one. I mean, well, I, I mean, the, the, the shell it, it looks like a ZM sonar, but with a different finish. Because, like, in terms of its general, is yeah, yeah, in terms of its general like shape. But it's nice. I agree with you, Simon. It's nice. The, the, what was the word you used earlier? The knurling? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. On the the knurling is like... Yeah, it's, it's got... Uh, I mean, I think they've done a good job with like these new lenses from the, the 35, the new 21, the 28 F2, uh, the new Ultron looks great as well. Um, but I, I, I agree. Like This one looks pretty sweet. I've had a... I mean, we've seen a lot of comments of people going like, this is not a real Heliar. This is not a real Heliar. I mean, I would argue that it is right for the yeah. the reasons we mentioned earlier. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm I'm slightly conflicted by it because, I, but I'm I'm just generally a, a, I like things to be to fit into boxes neatly, and uh, <laughs> and this does not fit neatly into a box, so it, it conf, conflicts me a little bit. But you know, it's it looks like the the results look like it's a, a helio. Interestingly enough, though, the it, it, the um, with actually the 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 PR. Um, uh, bullshit because that accompanies this, like talking about deliberately making it not work correctly and stuff like that. No, it's just a case of you can never make one of those work correctly. It's just impossible to do that. Um, but they they've taken it the, the way they're actually saying it is 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 a little bit disingenuous in in, in my opinion. Um, but uh, having just slightly getting angry at myself, I can't quite remember where I was actually going with uh, um, with with that. Um, oh. I know. I think I know where I was going there. Uh, one one thing about it is um, the price of it. Actually, I don't think that's where I was going, but I'm going to go there anyway now. Um, the price of it. Um, it's been commented that it's like it's expensive, and uh, it's you, not you, well, I know. I know this. This is a thing, and yeah. uh, and I think it's a general point for for us classic lens users that are used to buying lenses that are generally thirty, forty, fifty years old. 
and you know they've depreciated a lot but i would i would imagine a lot of those lenses if they were brand new today they would be a similar kind of price to, to this if not more um certainly the more desirable ones so um I, I wait what's the pr what's the price what's I the it's, well i, I think it's I, about 800 dollars. i'm not sure if that's with, with plus tax or some, something like that i don't know but um that's pretty good yeah, I, th I think it's for, for what it is, because at the end of the day, you've got to think about lenses when you actually manufacture these things. If you're going to, if you're going to be selling you know, hundreds of thousands of them, then that brings down the cost. And then if, you, if you're selling 50,000 of them, then the cost goes up. I mean, how many people are actually going to be buying this lens? I mean, will they, will they ever shift more than 10,000 units, something like that? I don't know. Right. But, but also, I mean, like fast 50 millimeter lenses in Leica M mount, brand new, what else is there that's cheap? Right, exactly. Well, <laughs> like, well, no, there's a there's an elephant in the room there, and it's it's like TT artisans and uh, seven. Oh yeah, but I mean, stuff like that. But that's their market, right? Like, you know, that, that, that like that's a completely different beast. The 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 weird Chinese lenses. Um, yeah. So I mean, just like completely ignoring them. Uh, <laughs> You can't. And, and the reason why I say we can't is because I own one. You know, I've got the 51.1 on, on, Le on Leica M. And, uh, and, and until Johnny turned me against it, I, I really liked it. Um, but uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, we, we are in that, in that market. And, and it's a case of, you know, on paper, it's a faster lens. It's, got, it's quirky and all this kind of stuff. And it's, you know, it's a, a quarter of the price. Of, the, of this lens so but I, I still bring it back to that I, I would say that this is a far higher quality in terms of its manufacturing process the uh, the barrel of the lens how it works and so on is going to be, the tolerances are going to be much better and there's a there's a lot of cost in that um, but also the the actual production run is going to be appreciably smaller so therefore they it is going to cost more so I don't I don't think it's too expensive for what it is I think it's probably about right it, it seems fine. I mean, it's cheaper than a ZM Sonar, right? And at this at this speed, brand new. What are you comparing it against? Like like a Sumicron, a, a Sumilux? Um, well, the, I, think I mean, they, like, they're not going head to head, are they? I mean, it's the, probably the closest no. is probably a Sonar. I would I would say. Right. Yeah. Like, and it's it's cheaper than a ZM Sonar. So I mean, eight eight hundred and fifty. It, it seems like a lot, but for what this is, especially in like an M mount, yeah, that seems totally reasonable. Like I wouldn't call it cheap, but it's, it's not. It's, it's not. It's expensive. beyond reasonable for a manual focus lens. It's historically, it's it's cheap. I yeah, mean, I, I think uh, I think you make that case. A lens in 1955 that costs 100 bucks would be a thousand bucks in 2021 money. You're talking. It's. I mean, it's it's exactly the same. It's it's exactly the same calculation as that. You know what I mean? Like historically speaking, this is a, a cheapish prime lens mm -hmm. yeah i agree right i mean it, it really is so i i mean i you just you can't make something to any degree of quality you you just can't for under that kind of money unless it's just chinese garbage i mean it's a, those chinese lenses they're i'm yeah they look nice they are literally disposable lenses mm -hmm. they're literally meant to be thrown away rather than repaired yeah. so that's the difference you know it's, yeah, and there, there, yeah. there's definitely differences in like the glass they're using. Right, right. Uh, it's a, it's a totally different market. I, you know, when, totally. when when people talk about those seven artisans and TT artisan lenses, it, I, I, I just forget they exist because, like, of course, <laughs> there's going to be like a cheap Chinese version of the legit thing you want to buy, and of course, it'll probably do the job you want it to do. Yeah, for how long is the question? Right, right. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so I, I agree with you, Johnny. I don't think this is expensive. No. I mean, if this stuff was popular, they'd be selling artisan lenses at Walmart. Right. You know. And I, I like the fact that – I really like the fact that they are um, doubling down on these, like, classic designs. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, Voigtlander makes a crap ton of 50-millimeter lenses now. They also have released their, like, APO, right? Yeah, right. Which is 
and, and you know that on the internet you're going to get a bunch of people complaining that this lens is like not well corrected. Yeah, oh, it's not, it doesn't even have a spherical element. Well, go buy right. one that does. They sell that. Exactly. It's <laughs> like they they have also released the APO Lanthar. Right. Um, which, you know, I, it, it, it and and they are serving two totally different markets. Right. Um, and this is the kind of lens that I think, you know, if you're into cinematography or if you like the classic feel more, this is way more appealing than something like the APO Lanthar, which would, may well kind of blow your mind uh, objectively yeah. if, if that's what you're looking at. It's. I think it's just fine that we have basically two companies left in the world still making decent manual focus lenses for film cameras, or mm -hmm. if you want to adapt them digital. I mean, that's literally all that's left. So I, you know what? Why would you give them a hard time for le for releasing a lens like this? Yeah. I. I mean, come you, on. Yeah, I mean, you, you <laughs> look at the comments on DP Review, and I think most of the people that listen to this podcast, the. the your your blood pressure will rise. Douche pile review. Forget them. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think another thing that um, I think we should um, uh, high five uh, Voigtlander for doing is making it single coated as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, just just a huge shout out to them. They've released so much cool stuff lately. Mm -hmm. You know, so much cool stuff. Like we 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 haven't even talked about or touched on like. The 35 millimeter APO Lantha, right? The 35 millimeter F2 um, is spherical. The new 28 millimeter Ultrons, which look amazing. I think Rob Jameson just bought one because um, we're kind of gushing over it. The 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 new 35 1.2, like they've really gone. The, the 75 1.5 knock on is mind blowingly good. Yeah. As well. So, I mean, like, good on them. If you go to their website and look at, like, their selection of, of like, a mount lenses, like, it's nuts. You know, they've got mm -hmm. four different 21 millimeter lenses that you can buy. Yeah. Um, so, like, that, that's awesome. Yeah. Stop the hate. Come on, people. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Also, uh, the, 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 um, the fact that, like, the Nocton, the 51.5 Nocton, and then this Heliar are, are literally both Voilander 50mm f1.5 lenses, like, that's kind of cool, right? Because they are, they're, the one, they're, they're one company that is not buying into this, like, all lenses need to be, um, you know, perfect with, like, smooth bokeh. They've got two lenses equal spec. Yeah. Of, I think, pretty similar prices. And they ignore the fact that they're all Cosina and, and ignore the ZM. Right. But if you if you include the ZM sonar, you've got literally three lenses. One is a Nocton, one is a Heliar, one is a Sonar. All fifty one point five. Like pick your poison. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, we didn't have that a couple of years ago. That's that's really sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, all right, so Johnny, I I actually wanted to ask you. Um, you have recently moved with a bunch of cameras uh, yeah. and shared some pictures of some very well organized boxes. Um, and you know something I'll be doing myself in a couple of months. So uh, yeah. hopefully that's not something you do very often. But do you want to talk us through you know your your thought process and experience there because that's moving with cameras when you have a huge collection. Yeah. Um, and then you have to move like it seems like a daunting task, you know. Uh, yeah, and I'm trying to find the company that makes the boxes that I use. Hold on a second. Let's see if we can. Uh, do I have one up here? I'm just trying to see if I have one up here. I think they're all downstairs, actually, in the basement. Um, but anyway, yeah, I have these really good storage containers that I bought a few years ago for lenses that are, like, just the right size to hold lenses. And um, and they're really excellent. I, that's where I store all my stuff, you know, when I'm not moving. But they're really good for moving because they're – you know, they're super sturdy um, and everything is, uh, you can pack everything up really well. Um, so I did that and I got a bunch of uh, basically like plastic moving totes um, for my camera stuff. And I, I wrapped that stuff all up in like, uh, not bubble wrap, but like foam wrap, like the harder foam wrap stuff. Um, and I have a... It's not Pelican, but I have a basically a 
jumbo storage case right now that has like 30 range finders in it. Like I stuck all my range finders in this one case. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, cause it looks like, it looks like something from, it looks like if like somebody was, uh, holding me ransom and they said, bring us 30 range finders by 12 o'clock. <laughs> it looks like a, it looks like a box full of ransom range finders. When you, when you, so, when you open the top of the lid on it, yeah, is, is it, is it similar to what happened with Vincent Vega and Jules in Pulp Fiction? Uh, does there's no light? No, there's no glowy light. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Or was wait? Or is that that other movie? No, no, no. That's that, that was the right one. Yeah, that's you got the reference. Okay. No, uh, the, there is no light that comes on. Although I'm sure I could rig up. They have lights that do that when you like open, you know, things up that come on automatically. I'm sure you could do that. But it has the flip. It has like the flip locks, you know, so that it's watertight. Um, maybe it is Pelican. I'm just grab it out of the. I'm gonna just grab it and open it up because you can hear this. I do this. I was walking over to my closet to get my oh, uh, box of rain finders. <laughs> um, so, oh, this is a Pelican case. All right. So, uh, this is a Pelican, a Pelican 1550, uh, and I'm gonna just open this thing up and when I open this up other than the cameras I've already taken out of it yeah it's just like a complete pelican case full of range finders and a couple of light meters and, and did you do you have like a foam thing in there there's it has a foam top like the the foam dimples uh-huh, uh-huh. it's like that on the top but the case itself has like it's like, uh, you know, it has like camera foam dividers where they're, you know, they're sort of gray and they have Velcro on them. So they're just, uh-huh. like, yeah. So it has that. I must admit, um, I was, I was wondering whether or not you just jammed the things in so tight that they couldn't move and therefore they'll be perfectly protected. Well, it's that as well, but I have dividers between each camera. I have like a little, I have one of those little dividers with Velcro from like an, all, all my various camera bags. I've got like a million of them. So I have like little dividers between each camera. That's intense. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like literally I fit all of my range finders in this box. So, and and did, did you move everything over in one go? Um, well, I mean, I had, I had movers that moved – most of the stuff, but I moved over like this case of stuff I took by I took myself, um, and I took some of my stuff, like the stuff I really wanted to make sure I didn't get screwed up. I, I, I brought all that over myself. So this was one of the things that I brought over on my own. Um, and did Did you bring your your shelves for your camera? Oh yeah, those are those are here in this room as well. Uh, they're. They're right. I'm looking at them. They're empty, but they're here in this room because that I've we've done basically everything except get this office finished off. It's like the last thing on the list, you know. Um, but I have the basically everything else in the house is pretty much moved in except for the office in the basement. Um, uh huh. So this. So yeah, the shelves are shelves are empty. I'm sending a picture right now of the. Because they looked like I don't know uh, the the when we've seen your place your 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 house looked um, the shelves look custom made. No, these are I'll send in a photo of these too. These are these are bullshit I, IKEA cases or uh, uh-huh. I, IKEA shelves. Um, it's just a lot of them. Just a lot of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just a lot of them. So, I mean, I, I think I think the thing that was like surprising, although I guess it shouldn't be surprising given how you store your cameras. Yeah. Um, looking at your move, like I was just taken at how organized everything seemed. Well, you know, like you had little labels and things on them. <laughs> is, it, yeah. is, it, is this a comment on Johnny in particular here? That, that no, like quite shocked he, about that. No, no, no. He's really organized with his cameras. Like when we've seen him on video, right? He's got this shelf with like a million cubicles, and each one has its own camera. When he's got yeah. his cameras lined up, it's like the Rolexes are lined up. The range finders are lined up like there, there, there's an organization about it whereas yeah, i think you know it, simon if you and sorry go ahead johnny no i was gonna say Crazy. but that's it's a, it's like a uh 
like an occupational hazard because I have, I don't know if we've, I don't know if we've talked about it. Well, we've talked about it, but we haven't had, so I have aphantasia, which means I have no visual memory. Um, I can't like normal people. I did not know this until literally this year that normal people can actually see things when they're remembering them. I don't Mm -hmm. see anything. I have a blank. Right. So if so, if I need to find something, I have no visual recognition of where it is. So unless it's like out on a shelf or unless I put it in the same place every time for like forever and know where to go, like a, you know, like a bumblebee that knows by, you know, pheromone where to find something, I'm never going to find it. Right. So I have to have everything like super well organized or I'm forget it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. So basically like, I have, I have my shelves, everything, you know, the cameras go on the shelves in a certain place. And then I do have my plastic containers and they're all labeled by, you know, Mount or whatever. Um, and then I, yeah, I have my bins that are all, or- so yeah, I, I like went out of my way to super duper organize everything because there was no way I was ever going to find it again if I didn't. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's actually really a pain in the ass. Um, uh, but I mean, it is what it is. So I just have to like kind of work around it, but you know, that's just the system that I came up with that, that works for my brain. Um, yeah, anyway, but well, I mean, so, yeah, it's super impressive. Cause I mean, I think if, if Simon or, or I were to move, which I will, um, like Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I, I spent a shit ton of money on just storage containers for cameras. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I've spent a lot of money on just containerizing everything so that it can, it can all be really, really well organized. So like once it's, once I have everything, I mean, it's, it's, most of that stuff is in the basement right now mm-hmm. and we're, we have not like, we, we have not had the basement finished, so it's still kind of a mess down there, but it's getting more organized. But it's so I basically have <laughs> it's even worse now because now I have all of these uh, these uh, st- wire shelving, you know, with the wheels, like the shop shelving. I have a bunch of that in the basement and I have uh, like three more that I have to put together specifically for for camera gear. So it all be it will all be in like containers and then on a shelf like so it's containerized and then shelved so that I can actually find it all so that's the that's the next phase of the organizing that's I, I'm very impressed I mean I, I've just got stuff like lying around well so. I do too I do too I mean stuff that I I use frequently I just leave lying around but you know now that I live with other people I can't be a complete and total slob so right. I can't just leave all my stuff. Cause like I used to have piles of camera stuff on my desk yeah. and I have kind of a shared office and I can't, I can't do that anymore. So it really needs right. to be well organized as opposed to just kind of out and about everywhere, which is my preferred organizing method. Man, I like, I, I'm getting a shelf custom made for my cameras for the oh, wow. new, for the new study. Nice. Um, well, it's cause it's just cause there's a natural, like, um, sort of nook in the wall yeah. and trying to buy a shelf from somewhere that's exactly that size would oh, actually yeah. be uh, more annoying than just getting one made. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like, I'm not looking forward to move. I'm nowhere near as organized as you are. Right. And, <laughs> and, and, and like, I'm just imagining, you know, Simon, like if you had to move all your crap from your pile. Right. And, and I, I think describing what you and I have in our study rooms as a pile is not inaccurate, right? Not, not at all. Well, the thing is, over the, over the summer, I've been trying to move out of my front room stroke office into a workshop that mm. I, I have for three D printing. And there's a there's a bookcase, an IKEA Billy bookcase, that I'll, I'm, I'm desperate to try and take out of my my office and get it down there. And every time I, I try and like make some space to be able to like clear clear a way to be able to take it out, I found I've already filled the shelf up, having already filled, having already emptied it, and taken all the stuff down to the workshop. So um, I, I don't know where it comes from. It just just keeps filling. I know. Up. 
I know it's 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 like you know one day you have enough space and then one day you've got stuff just flying everywhere because everything's full. Exactly. Uh, I have no. I same thing. I like I have an I have a Billy bookcase too, but I don't use it for. I, I use it for books, but I have the same problem. It's just like oh sweet new bookcase. Oh suddenly it's full of books. Where were these before? <laughs> like, what's what's going on here? The same the same thing with cameras. It was like one day. My my dry cabinet was full, and I was like, "Oh, that's all right." So I got one or two extra cameras. So I just put them on a shelf somewhere, and 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 now they're everywhere. They're just everywhere, and I don't know how. We can't. It's just physics. I mean, nature abhors a vacuum, and that's 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 all it is. You know. So you know, if you have space, it just gets taken. Yeah, uh, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm so scared about moving my cameras and stuff over. I mean, it's, uh, uh, the, you know, I don't know if, as long as it's well organized and packed well, like I, I wrapped, like I, I think I mentioned I wrapped, it's basically dish foam, like dish wrap. They, it's called dish. That's how they sell it here anyway in the U.S. It's called dish wrap. And it's basically like a uh, close cell foam that's mm-hmm. real thin. Um, so it's, you know, it's got a lot of cushion for thin material. It's It's got a lot of cushion. So I have... I stuck like I wrapped that stuff around everything and then put that in the bins. So everything is sort of like cushioned within the bins as well so that it can't get like super messed up. Not that it really would anyway, but I figured just, if you know, just so it couldn't bounce around on the moving truck kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean that, I don't know. I, it, it, it seemed to work for me anyway. Um, what, what what about like filters and accessories and 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 adapters oh, and shit like that? Dude, I'm not even kidding. I spent almost a week uh, organizing filters and caps and God. miscellaneous shit into plastic bins. Also, so I have bins of all that stuff also sorted. You know what really pisses me off though. Like right before I moved, I I finally bought a thirty nine millimeter uh, twenty five red filter, mm-hmm. and because I wanted to have it out, you know, I knew I was going to probably be shooting some stuff. And of course, I I have no idea where it is. I don't know if I packed it, but I have no idea where it is. Uh-huh. <laughs> so so I'm really kind of pissed about that. But um, but yeah, I mean, in theory, it might be with all of my filters, which are all in like. Well, it didn't fit in one bin. It's in multiple bins. But I mean, you've got your filters and accessories like labeled and organized and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to. I had to, or I was never going to find it all. I mean, I. Uh, that's that's you know, fair. Yeah. So I, because I had it all in like one room at my old place, and I knew that when I moved, some of it was going to be in the office upstairs, and a lot of it was going to be in the basement downstairs. And I, I mean, I'm gonna, I'll never find it all if it's not organized like that so that's that's fair yeah so it's all it's all labeled and organized i have most of the cameras are upstairs right here on the other side of my desk but not all of them and then most of the lenses are downstairs um which it's not like super you store your cameras and your lenses like multiple floors apart well i i I just i mean it was just temporary it's just when we were moving in some of the cameras ended up upstairs Right, right. Because I knew I'd probably want to use some of them. And then the most of the lenses went downstairs. So it's it's sort of, I mean, it's, it's it would just sort of like, okay, it spur of the moment as things are coming in the house via the moving crew, where do we, where do I direct them to go? You know, and I, all of the camera stuff is not going to fit upstairs. So I put most of it is downstairs. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, my I, I like the thought of organizing all the accessories is just a nightmare for me. I, I literally have a drawer that's just full of it, and then anything that doesn't fit in there is piled up on the table. Well, all right. So, but this is pretty easy. So you just get a you just get a couple bins, and the stuff that's in the drawers just throw it into the bins, and then you can have it like separated by, you know, I like I have adapter rings in one bin. I have filters in another i have hoods in another i have you know that's i did that sort of thing i just it just basic sorting right I, but i mean know. that's the thing with all of this sort of like life related admin right like yeah. con- conceptually it's very simple but finding the motivation to do it is oh it 
yeah. is, is is a challenge. So I'm just I'm I'm extremely impressed because I don't well, think I I might just end up doing something really lazy to get him over. I'm not sure what yet, but it it completely sucked. I mean, it was like I, I don't get me wrong, it it completely sucked because it took so much time. I mean, I was up I was up like I did like 12, 14 hour shifts of just organizing all this stuff. Jeez. But I had to get it done. I had no choice. It was never going to be, if I didn't do it before I moved, it was going to be an absolute shit show, you know? Mm. Yeah. So I just had to, I just had to do it. So anyway, it's done. Right. Yeah. So, but I mean, I would, I would, I guess I would recommend it. I think it's worth, yeah, for people who have like normal ability to recall where things are, it's probably overkill. You know, but I mean, it's, I don't know if it's a bad thing to be super organized. No, 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 not at all. It's a very good thing to be super organized. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, I think even for people with normal recall abilities, it's probably not a bad idea if you really want to be able to have all your stuff together, you know. So. All right. Well. I I feel uh, like it was time well spent. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I was hoping for some a- advice and tips that were just like be super organized, but uh, no, oh. I guess I guess that's the way to go. Well, I yeah, I mean, it, my my tip is just like keep things together. So I have like you know my cameras are sorted by mount, so I have you know bins full of M forty two or bins full of Olympus or bins full of pen or whatever, and then the lenses I have more or less separated by mount. Um, some of like, I think I have a bin that's all longer lenses. I do have a few of those, but I mean, that's literally because they didn't fit in the short bin. They needed to be in the tall bin. (laughs) So I have them in the taller bin and then I have the bins of, you know, adapters and filters and all that. So I don't know. I, it's just, I guess just logical, but I mean, you can, I guess what I'm saying is you can take it as far as you think you need to take it. Right. So you could like have all of your lenses together, just sort of jumbled up, but at least they would be all in the same sort of containers. Mm. Um, And these containers are, they're really nice. They're super, um, they're super, super durable. And if I really needed to, I could throw like uh, desiccant things into each one, like each one could have a big desiccant thing in it. So they would be sort of like, they're not, you know, they're not, completely vapor sealed but i mean they're going to be more or less humidity controlled right if i wanted to i could do that so it kind of kind of be overkill in my environment but it's it's certainly doable yeah Oof. well uh I'll, I'll keep you posted on how that goes when uh eventually comes around to it for me um nice Simon, uh, you've been very quiet during this. Uh, I think we're done talking about moving. <laughs> it, uh, well, it, it sort of uh, it fills me with the thought with dread. With you know, if I ever had yeah. to actually do that, like yourself, you know, it would be an absolute nightmare. Um, so hopefully, I'm not going to move house anytime soon. Um, but um, I'm just just thinking as well um, that we're going to. There was a thought about trying to keep the length of this podcast down as much as we could do which we fail every time and we say it quite often um but i've actually got quite a lot of things to talk about and i'm thinking no let's um let's park those things and uh put them into a into another week um but there's one thing i I really don't want to park Mm -hmm. and that is um i can't remember this is on facebook or whether it's on uh instagram i think it might be instagram I, i don't know um Vladislav Kern, friend of the show, um, Soviet lens, so sorry, Soviet camera expert extraordinaire. He's been sharing photographs lately. Oh yeah, and he they're has. really, really good. And they're, they're beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. This is Vlad Kern. Who? Oh, I just, I just collect oh, cameras. Yeah. I don't do. Yeah. I don't take no, photographs. I don't take I'm pictures. Not into, yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's not for me. Now you guys do all that kind of stuff. No, no, not me. Well. Check his photos out. He's, he's great. They're great. They're fantastic. I'm thinking, yeah. are these a collection over the last several years or something like that? No, no, they're recent stuff. So, yeah. uh, Vlad, you were lying to us. You're a good photographer. Yeah. What's his Instagram handle? Uh, it might be under US, USSR photo. I'm not sure if that, I know, certainly that's uh, his uh, normal one, uh, his main one, I think. But I don't know if he's. 
I don't know where I couldn't I couldn't find it where where I saw them. I was I was knocked out when I saw them. Uh, no, USS photo, USSR photo is just pictures of, of uh, right. So it's uh, I wonder if anyway, put put it in the show notes and uh, send me a link later. Yeah, it might be on his personal um, Facebook account. I don't know. Um, okay, but yeah, absolutely beautiful photos. You know, well well composed, well exposed, great composition. I've, I've just 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 really good photo. So uh, yeah, he's been he's been having us on. He's a really good photographer. Um, so uh, so that's that. So I'm going to leave the other things um so let's let's move on to trying to close the show down and the first thing i want to do is just to say uh thank you to those people that um have donated to us um in, especially while we've not been around um in particular there's a there's a, a few people that uh, subscribe to us and i, I have written to our subscribers um, to say sure you want to carry on doing this because we're not really putting many shows out um, so and they, they stayed uh, which is very nice as long as you carry on putting new ones out they said um, that was the, the general idea uh, which we plan to do um, so uh, thank you to those people and um, yeah so I just wanted to say that really um, if you want to get in touch with the show, and I think we've still got a couple of emails that we haven't done, and we still haven't announced the winner of the Cameragram competition, oh uh, which God, we need oh to uh, uh, do something on that one. I've still got uh, the prize from Animal Mystery uh, in in a sealed envelope. Um, it's a, a, a sealed new book uh, zine um, and in a sealed envelope uh, to go off to somebody. Um, so we'll do that in a future episode. Um, but as far as email is concerned, uh, what's the best way of getting in touch with the show? Uh, I was going to call you Rock then, Ken. Um, and no, you're not, not, you're not. I called you Ken then as well, didn't I? I don't uh, remember any of this stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, Johnny, <laughs> I can't even remember your name there. Um, so um, there is an Johnny email. doesn't. Johnny doesn't remember this stuff either. No. Okay. <laughs> it's probably like Classic Lenses Podcast at Gmail dot com. It is that. something like that. It def it definitely is. So uh, yeah, so drop us a line there if you want to uh, to talk to us, um, and um, let's let's do some shout outs. Uh, so I've got a couple of shout outs. So let's head over to Perry. Uh, have you got any shout outs? Oh, oh my god, I forgot we did this. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. I mean, no, you put put me on the spot. No, I know I, I can't think of any. That's okay. That's all right. Well, uh, Johnny, have you got any shout outs? Um. Uh, Dang, I mean, uh, it's been so long. I probably have a bajillion of them, but I need to thank Robbie for helping me move my goldfish. <laughs> Rob Robbie saved my ass and helped me move my goldfish to the new place. So, because moving, a, I could not move my aquarium by myself. So, mm -hmm. Robbie, Robbie came over and we literally moved goldfish. It was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I've I've got I've got two shout outs. Uh, first shout out being to Mike Gutterman, um, who, if anybody, um, well, if you don't know who Mike Gutterman is, then you should do. Um, he's the uh, um, the originator of the Negative Positives uh, podcast, and uh, uh, last week his his father died, uh, which is obviously a really tough time to him. So uh, big love to Mike, and uh, hope you're doing well there. Um, and uh, on, a, on a more positive note I just want to say thanks to uh, Jeff and Gabe of the I Dream of Cameras podcast uh, over on the Sunday 16 Presents uh, feed uh, for uh, keep, keeping me quite reasonably sane over these, uh, over these last few months uh, knowing that there are people out there even worse than me um, as far as gear and um, wishing to have it and stuff like that or at least making me feel normal anyway so uh, thanks to you guys um, good show if you if you haven't listened to it you should do i know that quite a few uh, people that um, regularly listen to us or used to um, have been listening to i dream of cameras so uh, if you haven't i would uh, head over there it's a really good show um and uh, so okay so that that's that i think we're done is there anything else we want to get off a of chest before we disappear no i'll take that as a no so. yeah. um okay so our music is by Kevin McLeod and oh, you just do your social media handles. Oh, we do, don't we? Yeah, Gosh, I'm a bit out of practice Whoa. on this. I have been doing the LFPP, um, but uh, but you're right. So, so Perry, 
Um, outside of this podcast, how can people keep up with the things that you do? Uh, you, you really won't find me active on social media because it's a little bit scary to do that in Hong Kong. Um, I mean, my Instagram is still there. It's Perry, at Perry G, same as Flickr, but I, I haven't posted in a long time. I don't know if I will. Um, but having said that, you mentioned the LFPP. Uh, and I, I do want to say I watched your live show a little bit of it. Um, and Simon, when you were holding the microphone uh, doing your kind of like interviewee news anchory thing, you looked like – I think I told you this, but this you must, looked like – yeah. I was just going to say this must be one of the early ones, but I think the last two, my, my camera didn't work. So uh, It was the first time you guys did it live. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and you looked like a – perfect cross between Tom Brokaw and Mr. Bean. <laughs> it was just like, it, it, it looked like you were made for that. So, well done. Well, it, was, it, was, it was good fun. It was a while ago. We need to do another one of those actually quite soon. Um, in fact, the whole idea behind that was that we were, we were going to have a, an actual get-together um, of large format photographers. LFPP means large format photography podcast, by the way. And uh, we were going to have a, a, an actual get together. Uh, and then COVID happened just in time. Um, so it never did. So we just did it virtually instead. So we've, I think we've had three of them now and we could probably do it doing another one because they're, they're good fun. We usually have a couple of guests that uh, uh, talk about the things that they do in a visual way. Uh, instead of just doing it uh, via audio so it's uh, it's it's good when we do that so uh, yeah that's cool that's cool thank you um did i did did you finish off there or i just hijacked you mm -hmm. i can't remember no no okay all right then so uh, so johnny outside of this the show how, how can people keep up with you no, uh, a whole new porch that you own. yeah you gotta come to my new porch now <laughs> so you would have to come to my new porch in my new neighborhood uh, so I'm on, I'm, uh, just off, uh, I'm on the Northwest side right near Foster and Cicero. Very easy. Uh, convenient access from both the Kennedy and the Edens. So, you know, stop on by, bring me a pizza. You gotta, you gotta dodge deer and stuff to get to your place, right? Yeah. You need to watch out for the deer. Yeah. Be careful of the deer because the deer are all over the place and, um what else do you have to watch out for and the, there's potholes there's a bunch of potholes on the street that runs parallel to the uh forest preserve because i think the city and the forest preserve are probably in a pissing match over who's responsible for repairing that road so nobody does it um so there's some potholes there's some deers uh that's about it do you have uh do you have feral raccoons I I got to tell you, I have not seen a single raccoon yet in this neighborhood. Um, I also haven't seen the coyotes, although my wife sees them when she takes the train to downtown and the station's just a block away. So the coyotes are out here. Um, so I don't know if that has anything to do with why I haven't seen any raccoons. I, I don't really have any squirrels either, maybe also because of the coyotes or the hawks. I don't know because there's a bunch of hawks around here, too. Have you uh, – back in your old neighborhood, though um, – well, sorry, Simon. While we're on the subject of raccoons, uh, back in your old neighborhood, did you ever hear um, raccoons, like, screaming at night, whether they're fighting or boning? Um, uh, yeah. Once in a great while, I, you would hear raccoon ruckus. It's, so, it's, it's terrifying, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty hilarious. And, and I will say this. So one of the other surprises left to me by the former owner of this uh, property was in the garage, in the rafters of the garage, there was at one time a raccoon nest. So they probably spent the winter up there. So there was basically like all this fossilized raccoon shit and <laughs> like – all this, you know, nesting material, which is uh, basically like they just chew paper up and make a big pile of paper. So I had to, I had to like, I had to clean all of the stuff out of the rafters, which was oh. ridiculous. Yeah, it was all on a board. So I basically, I took the board and pushed it forward off the rafters and it like slid down in front of the garage door into the, you know, into the, into the alley. And oh. there was just raccoon shit everywhere. It was really disgusting. It was like one of the times when I've worn, you know, a mask over the past year and a half that was not COVID related at all. It was purely like health related. 
because uh, <laughs> there was just all this rac- uh, fossilized raccoon dung everywhere. Simon, was- do you get do you get raccoons in the UK? No, but well, you just talked about that uh, that eerie, scary sound uh, that you hear at night with that with certain animals. Uh, no, that's just that's just the that's just that uh, the hen parties, right? Is that what you call them? <laughs> no. Well, you get that with foxes over here, mm. and uh, and it's if you if you hear it, you you think you're like. Some something horrible is happening to somebody or something like that. Yes, it's it's, it's yes, awful. Yeah, you know it's it's it, for anyone who hasn't heard raccoons screaming, like go, look look it up on YouTube or something. <laughs> it, it, and if foxes sound like that, well, it, that a that answers the question of what does the fox say? But um, <laughs> no, no, uh, nobody got that reference. So, but <laughs> but but the, the first time I heard raccoons screaming. Um, I was I was living in Toronto. I was like I must have been in my mid twenties, and um, I heard it in the middle of the night. And it sounds like demons possessing and slaughtering children. Yeah. Um, and 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 like I'd never done anything like this before. But I, it was like two a.m. I was horrified. I was so scared. I called my mom in Hong Kong. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was just like, Mom, I, I know I never called, but there's like a demon in my backyard and I don't know what to do. <laughs> so well, on on that note, um <laughs> I can be found on Twitter. Um as, um, <laughs> as uh, Simon Four. Um that's F O R rather than the number four. Um I am on Instagram. As Simon Forster Photographic. I also have a side account on Instagram as, uh, called Forster UK, which is uh, just uh, to do with my 3D printed products. Um, lens caps, lots of lens caps, front lens caps that are made of flexible material, real lens caps. I'm actually hot off the press. I've just finished um, and just about to launch doing, uh, I don't even know what the right way to say this word is. He has said so many different ways. Uh, I'm going to say Nikonos, but Nikonos, Nikonos, Nik- or however it is. The underwater camera. Um, I've made some lens caps for the actual lenses. Not the camera, because I haven't got a camera, but uh, Jeremy... Um, oh, my word, it's that long. I forgot what Jeremy's surname is. East, North. West. Jeremy North. Jeremy North. Um, sorry, Jeremy. Um, Jeremy North uh, lent me, um, uh, along with quite a lot of other stuff, actually, um, a Nikonos uh, lens. Uh, for, because you need the lens cap for it and I finally got around to making one uh, it's quite a cool design as well so um, so that, that's coming out soon um, and that's got to be about it we, you can find us on Facebook in our own little group which uh, if you don't answer the questions we won't let you in uh, which is uh, Classic Lenses Podcast strangely enough so uh, come, and, come and say hello to us there um, and that's it so uh, as I mentioned earlier our music is by Kevin MacLeod uh, and it's called Octo Blues, and uh, that's published through www.incompetech.com. So that's it. So I hope you've enjoyed this week's show. And if you can, be like Carl. <laughs> <laughs>